Bishop Jonas was actually the, the, the uh, minister that was sent to this area, both Ohio and Michigan, to begin to plant and, uh, and preach out churches. Well, originally it was Ohio. Bishop Jonas, uh, through Bishop Mason, uh, sent in this area and established the Church of God in Christ, and he was known as an overseer. Yeah, he was, he was overseer. Um, that was when they'd kind of done away with the overseer and, and, the, and the bishop, the, the, the name bishop actually came into existence at that time. Bishop Jonas, uh, after uh, receiving uh, salvation at the Azusa Street Revival conducted by uh, Elder Seymour, he was given an assignment. And a part of his assignment was to go to the train depot because the word of the great revival had broken out and uh, Elder Jonas or Brother Jonas at that point uh, was given the assignment to go to the train depot to pick up those who were coming to this great revival. And on this specific day, he went and picked up uh, Elder Mason, Elder Jeter, and Elder Young. And he brought them to the Azusa Street Revival. And he was also present when Bishop Mason received the baptism of the Holy Ghost at the revival. Bishop Jonas was a very humble, great leader, very humble person. Uh, I did not know Bishop Williams. I have, I've heard Bishop Williams' messages. I, um, I knew that he was one of the greatest preachers in the Church of God in Christ. He had a great reputation for being a great preacher. He was also the first bishop of Ohio. Um, he became the first bishop of Ohio in 1932, I believe it was. My research of the history of Riley Williams tells me that in 1931, Bishop Mason sent him to Ohio. There was no agenda, there was no plan. He was just here to see. And while he sat in the pulpit, one of the members sent him a note saying that if you would come, I would be your member. And by that night, he had his first five members. Well, I tell you, he was uh, he's a friendly man, a great preacher, and um, just a real visionary. Bishop Riley Williams, was a very progressive pastor and minister. I admired his qualities of sincerity and the love that he showed to everyone. 1931, when uh, Bishop Riley Williams uh, became, he became the, under the term bishop. Bishops were not used under Bishop Jonas, they were used as overseers. But Bishop Riley Williams was known as the first bishop with that title, and he brought in more of the jurisdictional concept and the organizational. Bishop Jonas was like a great evangelist um, and just evangelized territory. Um, but uh, Bishop Riley Williams, that's where Ohio, well, technically there was no north, south, east, west. It was just Ohio. And sometimes he didn't even have to preach. Sometimes when he would come here at Williams Temple, he was so highly anointed that he would just walk uh, down these very aisles and people would pa pass out. Bishop Miller was a father. He was a very, very uh, good leader. He didn't do a lot of talking. He did more work. They referred to him as Grandpa, which to me spoke to uh, a, a kind, um, gentle, and, and loving, loving kind of man. I also knew that he and Bishop Williams were instrumental in, in a lot of the national uh, work. Bishop Miller, I remember him sitting in our church. I was a teenager in the choir, and he would get ready to preach, and we would just stare at him because he wore a skull cap all the time. He wore this skull cap, and he would sit so erect and dignified and get up and talk in a very distinct manner. Each word was articulate, and we just stared at him. We just thought he was some kind of king or something with this, with this uh, skull cap on. Very regal. I remember my grandfather as being a man of, I would call regal stature. He just carried himself with an air of confidence, professionalism, and he seemed like he would be aloof, but yet he was accessible. U.E. Miller was a very quiet person. He was here after the death of Bishop 
Williams, and I believe Bishop Williams died in 52. We also call Bishop U.E. Miller Grandpa, just like everybody else, because his granddaughter and I were good friends. I was always impressed with Bishop Miller. He was such a kind of elegant, <laughs> um, you know, man, uh, very uh, distinguished kind of person. I remember in his home, he was always sitting back in his favorite chair and talking with the family. And I remember one time, I, I couldn't play the piano, but I just would play at it. And he had a grand piano uh, in his home. And I loved to just go over there and start playing on the keys and feeling out a little tune or whatnot. And I remember them coming in saying, get up off the piano, don't be bothering the bishop, you're, you, you're disturbing him. And he would say, leave him alone. He's all right, I'm enjoying him. But he, he was just that type of person, a very gentle person, soft-spoken, extremely well-dressed. He, he was known for dressing. Just by reading, um, uh, he was a great builder, architect, uh, the building of Mason Temple, uh, the building of uh, Williams Temple. Uh, you, I mean, you're talking Bishop U.E. Miller along with, because I, I heard that he was, Bishop U.E. Miller was a, a secretary of the National Church. Many of these men not only served in Ohio, and that's the uniqueness of this centennial celebration. All these bishops' names that we're bringing in, all of them contribute not just to Ohio North, but they help develop the Church of God in Christ on the national level. R.S. Fields, Bishop R.S. Fields was an accomplished and effective leader. Um, now Bishop Fields was, was, was interesting in his leadership style. He, um, he was the type that he, he knew what he wanted. And if he appointed you to do, do a job, if you didn't get that job done, Bishop Fields didn't waste time trying to go to you second and third time, he get somebody else to do it. My dad was uh, Bishop R.S. Fields. Um, and as I said, he got his start here at Williams Temple. Um, actually, he met Bishop Williams prior to his coming into this building. Uh, he was a young boy uh, when the family moved from Summerfield, Tennessee. I just knew him as a stately man. I recognized his voice, his unique voice. Bishop Fields had a very gravelly sounding voice. I can't do it. I do remember one word, every time they take the offering, I remember him saying, this meeting carries a great expense. And we would always say it with Bishop Fields. You just remember that voice. Hey, everybody, you know, God bless you. You know, he just had that voice that you would never forget. I tend to remember him just as from a child's aspect. Uh, this large man walking in, and it, it was though when he moved into a room, the room moved around him. He was serious. He was very humble. He had a beautiful family, daughters and sons and uh, Irvin and his other sons and grandchildren, Doris and her older sister, all of them, they had a big family. Bishop Fields was a very unique person. He uh, was very administrative. He had a way of bringing people together. He was really an astute person, smart, and then he could control. Well, Bishop James uh, succeeded uh, my dad. I thought he was a very nice person, very friendly outgoing, progressive. Oh, clearly um, worship. He was a, a tremendous worship leader. He, um, he introduced us to, um, really, he introduced us to worship uh, over and above just praise. Uh, and yet he also introduced us to praise that led to worship. When I saw him, he would just speak, he just, hey, how you doing? Always smiling, always had a grin. Um, just very f outgoing. Bishop James was a good leader. He loved the church. 
He loved the church and he loved his job as a bishop. Bishop James meant what he said and said what he meant. Bishop James was a very friendly man with a great smile. He would come to our church when we were young. He would come and Bobby Huntley would be with him and Sister Bradford and all the older saints would, uh, Little Willie James is coming to run a revival. Little Willie James is coming and they, oh, it was an air of excitement. Bishop William Morgan James, uh, he was known as the young preacher. Uh, they labeled him the young boy preacher. And uh, he was well known as our international youth president, a part of his contribution to the national church. He was known for his, his worship style. You know, he was, uh, he, he was insightful. You know, he uh, um, gave information, you know, which I thought was, was good. Uh, you know, so that was the kind of thing that attracted me to, to his, his kind of preaching. He uh, was such a genuine person who had a common touch with everyone he met. He was great with the seniors, great with the youth. And Bishop James was one who really uh, contributed a lot of things to my life. Bishop Jordan, uh, clearly um, one of the three most influential men in my life. Uh, his, the way he carried himself, his demeanor, um, his presence, um, his sincerity, uh, and yet um, I, I got the chance to spend some quality time with him over a period of years, and I found him to be personable, uh, extremely funny without himself cracking a smile. It was dangerous to sit next to Bishop Jordan in the pulpit. Bishop Jordan was an awesome man. In fact, my husband reminds me of Bishop Jordan and their leadership style. Uh, he loved the people. Uh, people love him. I know him as being quiet, a good, excellent preacher. Bishop Jordan was a good preacher. He was a, a, a good leader, committed, dedicated young man. He loved the Lord. Ah, Bishop Jordan was a man of power, spiritual power. He, to me, he walked in spiritual power without even speaking. I just honored his presence. One thing about Bishop Jordan, he was the only bishop at that time, I remember that always carried a smile. He, great preacher too, you know. Um, he and I would hang out together. Uh, we would go to, you know, in Memphis, we would always hang out together, you know, eat dinner together and things of that sort. I think his legacy, he was an outstanding person. He was very precise, direct. When he built our church, he was a, a very hands-on. He helped design uh, the interior of the building. And one day I remember him coming to church and he told the architect, he said, the choir stand, the railing on the choir stand is not centered. He said, uh, excuse me, Bishop, we measured. He said, measure it again in front of me. They measured it, they remeasured it and they were off. And he saw it with the naked eye. Bishop Cook is a good friend of mine, great Bishop. Um, we have traveled so many places together uh, before either one of us were, were bishops or even thought about being a bishop. We would travel to different conventions uh, to get information just so we would, you know, have some insight into how to, you know, develop churches, grow churches, develop our people and things of that sort. Well, growing up, my dad was a businessman. And so he worked a regular nine to five. Um, when he came home, he was a family man. Bishop Cook is a very smart young man, very sincere. He and my brother worked together at, in, under the uh, finance committee and in, in uh, Memphis. My brother was over the finance. He worked hard. He was very hun honest, sincere. He was, he was faithful and uh, both of them, both of them worked together hand in hand, like brothers, Bishop Cook and, and Bishop and, and 
uh, 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 Superintendent uh, William Terry. It's been wonderful working with Bishop Cook as jurisdictional bishop uh, because initially I worked with Bishop Cook before I became a supervisor. He would walk in that door with a smile on his face and everybody would look up and go, here he come, here come Terry, he's on his mission. And, that, and that's, that's how I remember him. He was uh, innovative in terms of church administration, uh, was able to uh, just draw a lot of inspiration uh, from him. I've known Mr. Cook for a long time. Uh, we used to, we used to uh, have challenges in the Sunday school department. Uh, Bishop Cook and another uh, uh, superintendent that we had when I worked under Dad Mellox in the Sunday school department. I got to know him fairly well. Very uh, easy to talk to, very approachable. I think Bishop Cook is a great man. Any man that understands the legacy and the heritage from which he comes and embraces that, and not only embraces it, but propels it forward, not only is, has wisdom, but has a call of God and understands that in order to go forward in the future, you have to embrace your past. He has entrusted with our future. Bishop Cook loves local pastors. He does everything he possibly can to encourage us and give us every tool to minister to this generation that we're in right now. Mother Coffey was the first supervisor for Ohio. And Mother Coffey also started the auxiliaries and union. The only thing I remember about Mother Young is that she sat in a chair and as she talked, regardless of how, what, what subject she was on, she would always look out into the audience and relate to somebody. She was a very beautiful woman, a very soft-spoken and kind woman, and served as a supervisor longer than anybody in the history of, uh, certainly of this jurisdiction. Mother Lola C. Young, I thought she was so pretty, so nice, so quiet spoken. She would come actually to my house to go fishing with my grandmother. Mother Young was a kind person. Uh, she didn't talk a whole lot. Mother Young was a very kind and, and beautiful woman. I didn't have too much interaction with her because I was young. Mother Gould, can't leave Mother Gould out. Mm -hmm. Mother Gould was right by Mother Young. You know, Mother Meredith was a friend. I roomed with her in uh, Memphis. Mother Meredith, I knew during the youth department. Mother Mary Ellen Meredith, uh, her pattern of speech, I loved the way she talked. I remember her working with my dad in the finance department. I remember that. Mother Thompson, I did a lot of work. Uh, in the women's department with Mother Thompson. She would come to our church every year to run a revival, and every year I'd, I'd moan and groan because it usually was a full week revival, maybe longer, but I never regretted her coming. She, Mother Fields and Mother Boyd, they had my back. They had my back. She started running revivals at our church in Toledo every year. The jewel of the jurisdiction. She was the first appointment I made. Um, in fact, I, I also know, I honestly know that the bishop doesn't appoint the supervisor. He selects the supervisor. But um, from my experience with Mother Butts when she was uh, appointed by Bishop Jordan and observing how she worked with him, there, is, there was no question in my mind that I wanted Mother Butts to serve as supervisor not just for continuity, but because I saw her as, as a woman who would never lead the women of Ohio North contrary to my leadership, that she would understand what the vision was and that would become her vision. She was young enough and old enough and quite honestly, she's a very smart woman. I've been a member over 62 years, thank you. Mother Thelma Giles Butts, she's such an innovative state supervisor. 
she started taking us to a place called Kalahari on a retreat. Fabulous place, swimming and it, just stretching out and making things more luxurious for the women. If you're going to have a retreat, let's, let's really have a retreat. Mother Butts is the bomb.com. I love Mother Butts to life. She, she is the type, because she's been around so long in this church, she can identify with the older women and with the younger women. She's full of life. Uh, everybody wants her, but she's ours. And I really thank Bishop Cook for keeping her as our jurisdictional supervisor. I have been a member of Williams Temple since 1960. Well, the church is probably about 87 years old, going out perhaps into the 88th year. Uh, the historical church, it was actually the um, breeding spawn for all of what took place in Church of God in Christ uh, over 80 years ago. Growing up at Williams Temple was like, it was a home away from home. Because as a preacher's kid, you spent as much time here as you did at your own home. Oh, well, back in the day, uh, especially when we was young, we came over here to, well, Matty Moss Clark used to do a song is born and uh, the choirs used to get together, and we came over here for a lot of reasons. Church field, beautiful choir. Thelma Dorsey was the organist. Lil was right by our side. That the sister went to choir. We had a beautiful choir. As in my younger years, I sat right here on the bench next to my mother during morning service as she played for the Sunday morning service because no one would watch me, so I had to sit with my mother during service. Oh, it was, well, it, it was full, a full house, a full house, four choirs. Uh, the anointing was high, high, high. The, 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 uh, the uh, atmosphere was just uh, beautiful. The thing that I just recall is that it was, of course, a natural part of the ministry of the church. But I do remember that um, that broadcast drew people. William Temple has always been a beacon for the city of Cleveland. Uh, all of the pastors who served here uh, were leaders and great leaders, in, not only in Cleveland, but in that, that in the church. Yes, I, th this, is, this is home. This is home. I believe we came to Williams Temple in the late 50s. Uh, Bishop Miller, U.E. Miller, was the pastor then. Uh, I believe Bishop Riley F. Williams' wife was yet alive, but he, had to, he was deceased. Well, growing up, what I remember about the convocations at Williams Temple was it would be so crowded that the basements would be full, and yet there would be people standing outside, and yet the next night there would be the same crowd there. They wouldn't be disappointed or discouraged that they couldn't get in, but they would still come back because they wanted to be in the presence of the saints and in the presence of God. Most of us came from little storefront churches, so to come here was amazing, and it just was so enormous to us, so beautiful, so rich, so elegant. Williams Temple was the palace. It was the ultimate visitation. It was uh, where, at minimum, three, four times a year, we would come and spend anywhere from five to eight days of our life and in those days, that meant traveling back and forth to Toledo every night. I, remember, I do remember also um, when we would come driving up and seeing all of the cars and people in the balconies and, and outside. And I just remember coming and it was just people everywhere. Every time we rode the bus, it broke down. We finally got smart enough to uh, have our in-house mechanic he just rode on the bus with us so that we wouldn't have to call him to come where we were. And, uh, and even that, uh, like I said, was, it was a joy. We, f we fellowshiped, we, uh, we brought blankets and pillows and plenty of food, and we sang until uh, Brother Franklin arrived. He always kind of knew what was wrong, fixed the bus, and we made our way uh, to the meeting. 
Well, you know, the balcony was all the place where we hang out with our friends and our buddies. And I tell you, uh, I never went in the balcony. No, a uh, combination of being in the choir and then later, as I got a little older, being a minister, uh, I was always in the front. Well, we had some of the greatest cooks in the city of Cleveland right here at Williams Temple. And then we would be in church and we'd smell this odor of fried chicken and... Oh, we couldn't wait till church was over to go downstairs and eat. Well, it, the thing about chicken uh, during the service is that Williams Temple's chicken always smelled a little different. Uh, smelling chicken during service was common in almost all of our churches. But uh, there was something about the, the chicken that, that was being cooked downstairs you never wanted to leave this building without having a piece of fried chicken. I didn't know at the time that um, my wife's aunt was one of the primary cooks. I found out later, um, and, and that was good. Uh, it's always good to marry into a family with assets. Oh, wow. I must say that my aunt, my dad's sister, Gladys Jackson, she was the number one cook for this church. Whatever you wanted, she could cook it. Uh, and yes, it was hard sitting up here on Sunday morning trying to focus and you're smelling the food downstairs. It was very hard. In fact, I, I got in trouble plenty of times uh, when I would tell my mom I need to go to the bathroom and I would go downstairs and I would try to talk my aunt into giving me a piece of chicken. Sometimes she would and sometimes she wouldn't. Well, it was something about uh, the fried chicken. And, you know, we, we all oftentimes hear the slogan of Kentucky Fried Chicken, it was finger licking good. I want to tell you, it was more than just finger licking good chicken here. It was worth the wait. It was something, uh, it, was, it was something to the cooks of Williams Temple that had a way of alluring and attracting people downstairs. And the chicken was just phenomenal. Oh, wow. Uh, when you service, you could just smell the chicken, the fish. Um, they just, you know, people just like to eat that day. Uh, I can't imagine it was a, probably a dollar or two dollars. We'd be going downstairs trying to break the kitchen down, trying to get the chicken and the hot sausage sandwiches and, and <laughs> all of those. They had good food, good food at all times, big, big services, great services. Wow, the musicals that we had, I'll start with Richard Smith and Regina Flowers. It was an exciting, fun time. Woodland Temple, then Williams Temple. All, you'd see preachers from everywhere, bishops from everywhere, the choir. I, you're talking about could sing. Elder Butts was the uh, president of the Ohio North of uh, choir. I never missed a musical, and it was, if it was here, it was the highlight of the, um, of the meeting. Well, Ohio North, Richard Smith, you, you could not say music without saying Richard Smith. Richard Smith actually set the tone for the music in Ohio North and the whole state of Ohio. Thelma Dorsey was uh, a, a, a unique mix in, in that particular time. What made my mother different from my recollection would be her ability to cross all kinds of lines, whether it be a Caucasian ministry or a black ministry or a gospel ministry or a Baptist ministry. She, she was able to play for all of them. My mother had told me she was going to train me to play the piano. So that night before I was supposed to start, I went downstairs and plucked all of the strings out of the baby grand piano her father gave her. And what did she pluck out of here? She wouldn't pluck anything because she said she'd kill me if she touched me. I can remember her sitting playing the organ on a, a Fisher Day and then through the week when Williams Temple Choir was singing and she always played for Bishop Fields. And she always played for her sister that was singing a solo, Sister Dorothy Williams. Ohio North is different primarily because first and foremost it's stable. It has a group of, of men and women who are stable in God, stable in their uh, relationship 
with God and with the church and, and really committed to God and the church. Tell me about uh, 